Now, I worked for the NDP when I was a kid, and I had privileged access to the leadership for provincially and federally for reasons that I won't go into, and I thought that many of them were honorable people who were really striving to give the working class a voice, and I believe that the working class needs a voice, a political voice, for obvious reasons. Um, I think the Democrats in the United States have made an absolutely dreadful, abysmal mistake replacing their working class political ethos with identity politics. We're going to talk about that. And uh, and I don't think the situation has changed that much. I think one of the things that's happened in the United States is that world stability and peace in some ways has been purchased at the expense of North American working class well-being. You know, because the Chinese have got rich compared to 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. The, in the Indians have got rich, again, same comparison basis. There's more middle class people in India now than there are in the United States. Um, the trade arrangements that have been in North America allowed for the rise of middle classes globally at the same time they opened up the working class in North America to competition from those low wage sources. And maybe that's a good deal. It's hard to say, right? Because it's not such a bad thing that the Chinese aren't starving, and it's not such a bad thing that the Indians aren't starving, and that those societies are transforming themselves actually into communities that are quite wealthy. It's like, hooray for that. It's an absolutely miraculous transformation. It's the most rapid growth of human wealth in the history of humanity. So we should be pretty happy about that, but we should also remember, at least to some degree, who's paid the price for it. And so, as far as I'm concerned, the working class needs a voice. And it isn't obvious that they have one at the moment. Having said that, however, it isn't obvious to me at all that the people who purport to stand for the working class actually do so, or that if they do so, that the reason they do so is because they're all compassionate and sympathetic and loving and kind and saint-like, I'm more convinced by Orwell's argument. So, back to the NDP. The people I met at the leadership level, a lot of them I had a fair bit of admiration for, but as I worked with the party over about a five-year period, there was this contradiction that came kept emerging for me, and that was that I didn't really like the low-level party functionary activist types. Like, they just weren't personally appealing to me. They seemed peevish and resentful. And then, at the same time, I, I was going to college. I was about 17. I got elected to the, sit on the College Board of Governors, and at that time, Alberta was conservative, politically, right? It still is, of course, but they, it was part of the progressive conservative empire because uh, they ruled Alberta forever. And all the Board of Governor members were basically nominees, right? They were conservative nominees, so these were conservative people. And I was an NDP member, and I thought... And I'd worked for small businessmen, too, who weren't NDP. They were, they were conservative. I could never figure that out, but I'll tell you about that in a minute. But I had a bad case of cognitive dissonance, because it actually turned out that I admired the people on the Board of Governors. And they were mostly, it was in Grand Prairie, it's not a very big place, and it's not very old. And so, if you were reasonably successful in Grand Prairie, the probability that you had inherited your money from the aristocracy was like zero, because there wasn't one, right? It, the whole damn town was 50 years old. So, if you had any influence or, or wealth, you were a small businessman, small to middle-sized businessman, and you'd, you knew what you were doing. And I actually admired these people. I thought, well, that's not very good. I admire them, and I don't share their political views. And then there's these other people with whom I hypothetically share political views, and I don't admire them at all. What's going on? And then I read Road to Wigan Pier, and I thought, oh, that's it. They don't like the poor. They just hate the rich. <laughs> it's not the same thing. It's not the same set of motivations. And so let's say that you're a postmodernist, and you privilege compassion for the oppressed. You think, well, what do you push to the margins? Well, what are you doing with all your hatred and your resentment? 
and you're evil. It's like, you don't have any of that? That's a bad theory. That's a really bad theory. Okay, so fine. So you can say, well, yeah, you can say that, but I don't buy it. I still think that the people who stand to speak for the oppressed are in fact motivated by empathy and sympathy. Their hearts are in the right place. See, I don't really buy that either because I don't really think, generally speaking, that it's a credible claim for someone to make that their heart is in the right place. Now, you can ask that of yourself, and if you think your heart is in the right place, well, more power to you, you know? I, I, I can't see the halo from here, however. <laughs> And so, given that you're just as malevolent as your neighbor, or maybe even more so, and that that's actually pretty malevolent given the intrinsic nature of human beings, I can't help but wonder what you're doing with all those traits that you're not admitting to. But you can... You could even object, well, you know, that's a pretty pessimistic view of humankind. It's not, by the way, it's just not naive. But anyways, you could object that, and you could say, no, actually, the weight of moral authority is, in fact, on the left, even the radical left, with those who identify with the oppressed and who are working to better their conditions. Okay. Fair enough. So then let's say, well, let's give those people some power. And if they're actually motivated by compassion and empathy and desire for the working class, if you give them power, and you give their ideas power, then as those ideas unfold in real time, you're going to find out, like, do things get better for the working class, let's say, or do they get worse? Because we could, we could consider that like an experiment, we could consider the outcome proof. I, I, I don't know what else you would do, I don't know how else you would, you would come to your decision. Because it's just theory till you see it happen. Now Nietzsche said back in the 18, late 1800s that after he said that God was dead, and I suppose that would also mean the theory that, of suffering that I outlined at the beginning that is at the basis of Judeo-Christian civilization, that God was dead and that people had killed him and that we'd never find enough water to wash away the blood. It's a paraphrase, but I've, I've got the basic message right. And he also said, there'll be two consequences of that. Nihilism, because there's no transcendent meaning, and a move to totalitarianism because people can't tolerate nihilism. And he said the most likely pathway to totalitarianism would be communism, essentially. He didn't quite use those words, but he meant that. He, the words are close enough. Uh, he said socialism, but I'm going to use communism to distinguish it, distinguish it from democratic socialism. And he said that probably tens of, hundreds, tens of millions of people would die in the 20th century as we played out that experiment. And then he said, but it might be worth it if we learn something from it. Rough, man. I mean, and, and unbelievable. Like, I cannot figure out how in the world he knew that that was going to happen especially so far in advance. But Dostoevsky knew the same thing. He wrote this book called The Devils, or The Possessed. You could read that. That's a great book. It takes about 150 pages to get going. But once it, it like everything, everything snaps together after that, you know, and, and then it moves. And it's basically his prophecy about, it's an examination of the kind of person who had arisen in the aftermath of the death of God in Russia, who would lead the communist revolution. That's essentially it. It's brilliant. It's, it's, it's terrifying. And it's a great intro to Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, which describes what did happen when those sort of people took over the revolution. So let's look at what happened after the revolution. And we might say, well, this, how about we replicate the experiment a few times? Because you know how it is. If you're running a scientific experiment, you want to find out what something does if you allow it to behave. You don't want to just run it once because, well, maybe there was something specific about those conditions that led to the outcome. You want to generalize it across multiple circumstances. So we might say, well, let's take this set of ideas and let's, uh, let's run it on a large scale over a very long period of time in a variety of exceptionally diverse cultures and languages. 
So let's do that. Okay, well, we could first start with the, with the Soviets. People, even now, because it's like the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, are celebrating Lenin. It's like, th that's not good. That's like celebrating Hitler. Okay, I'm dead serious about that. It's not good. And the fact that people can dare to think that that's okay means that there's something wrong with the way that we look at history. Lenin was a monster. And if you want to know about that, you can read Solzhenitsyn's writings about Lenin. Because the communist apologists say, well, it wasn't Lenin. Lenin was a good guy. He was all motivated by love of the working class. It's like, well, his henchman was Stalin. And if your henchman is Stalin, you're not a good guy. <laughs> and, and Lenin was around during the early collectivization. And if you read what he wrote, you'll find out that he was perfectly willing to have any number of people die as long as his ideological system could be brought into being. So, there's no celebrating Lenin. There's no, we're cool, young, Marxist, hip revolutionaries, and he's our idol. It's like, there's none of that. Not if you know anything. Not if you're decent. Well, there was the death of the Kulaks, I told you about that. There was the Ukrainian famine, that's six million gone there. There was the rise of the Gulag state, because it turned out that Russia, the Soviet Union, couldn't run on the principles that it had, that it had uh, uh, laid down as sacrosanct. They just didn't work, so you had to enslave everybody and run your economy as a slave state, essentially. Uh, and try not to kill the people in the gulags so fast that you can't suck some productive labor out of them. It was the death of tens of millions of people. We don't even know. The estimates range from 15 to 60 million. And like, we won't get too picky even about the numbers because after the first 10 million, you kind of made your point. And the fact that we don't know between 15 and 60 is actually an indication of the horror of it. Because our count is off by tens of millions. And that's only within the last century. And then there was the 1956 crackdown on Hungary and the 1968 invasion of Czechoslovakia. Then there was the whole like thermonuclear holocaust thing that was going on at the same time and the fact that in 1962 and in 1984 we were seconds away from complete annihilation, right? During the Cuban Missile Crisis, the keys were in the intercontinental ballistic missile release systems and Castro, as he admitted to Jimmy Carter, in case any of you are Castro fans, which you shouldn't be, <laughs> that he was perfectly willing to have Cuba annihilated if it would have meant the defeat of the United States. And then in 1984, approximately, I may have the date exactly wrong. The Russians received an indication from their early warning systems that the Americans had launched five thermonuclear missiles. And one Russian decided that it was a mistake and refused to launch the retaliation. And he just died about two weeks ago. So, you know, that was pretty close. And uh, so that was experiment number one, let's say. That, that wasn't good, that experiment. Let's put it that way. It wasn't good. It was exactly the antithesis of good. It was precisely the antithesis of good. But that wasn't all. I mean, there's the People's Republic of China. That's a different country. Like, seriously, a different country, right? Different tradition, different language. How many people died in China under Mao? No one knows. Same issue with the Soviet Union, although Mao was a bigger monster than Stalin, and that's, that's impressive, you know, because there's Hitler, there's Stalin, and there's Mao. And of the three, Mao was probably the worst. He's still revered in China. Uh, maybe that accounts for their affinity for North Korea, which could still destroy us all, the remnants of that horrible state. Maybe 100 million people died in China during the Great Leap Forward. That's a hell of a leap forward. Well, maybe it wasn't 100 million, you know, maybe it was only 40 million. But as I said before, when you're counting in the tens of millions, your point's already made. And then there was Cambodia and the killing fields and Bulgaria and East Germany and Romania and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, that's North Korea, and Vietnam and Ethiopia, Hungary, etc., etc., etc. 
It was never a successful communist state. Cuba, I suppose, came closest, but it was radically... Um, the Soviets poured money into Cuba, so that doesn't really count. So then the first question was, well, are these Marxists motivated by love or hatred? Well, is it love or hatred that produces 100 million dead people? And is that enough evidence or not? And if it's not enough evidence, if you think to yourself, well, that's not enough evidence, it was never really given its proper, a proper try. It's like, well, what would have been a proper try? See, I always think when I hear someone say that, I know what you think. You think in your delusional arrogance that you understand the Marxist doctrines better than anyone else ever has, and that if you were the one implementing those doctrines, you would have ushered in the utopia. That's what you mean when you say that. And, you know, they're, they're, they say, in, in, there's an idea in the New Testament that there's a sin, it's the sin against the Holy Ghost. If you commit that sin, no one really knows what it is. That you can't be forgiven. And I would say, well, if you want a candidate for the sin against the Holy Ghost in the 21st century, uh, the statement... Communism, real communism was never tried with the underlying idea that if you had been the person implementing it, it would have worked. I think that's a pretty good contender for something for which you should never be forgiven.